Hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. It is uh, Thursday right now. We're in the middle of the day and uh, markets are up on the week. Uh, they're, a little, they're down a little bit here today, but it's been, I mean, as far as the last two months go, maybe a little bit more boring of a week in the grand scheme of things. Um, earnings season has begun. We, we haven't had a ton of companies start reporting yet. It's still less than 10% of the S&P 500. That'll be picking up um, more tomorrow. And then in the next week is the heaviest week of the quarter and the week after that. So it's really the next two weeks we're going to get into the heart of earnings season. But um, I, I think that right now it's a good time to kind of pause and, and think about some things where I don't have to update about the crazy volatility we're having because it's actually subsided a little. And there isn't, um, although you, you know, you're in the middle of a lot of this stuff with the investigation and President Trump's attorney and some of that, I, the market doesn't care about any of it. I barely really care about any of it anymore. Uh, but um, short of a big news catalyst, uh, uh, another trade and tariff fiasco or things like that. It's nice to not really have anything that is so ad hoc in the news cycle that it forces me to spend this time talking about that. I kind of want to take advantage of it to talk about some other investment oriented things, you know, like the good old days. Um, the thesis to be bullish right now in this market is that there are um, positive things happening in the economy, which in and of itself is not enough to be bullish on stocks. You can always have periods where things are going well in the economy, but the impact of those good things to corporate profits has already been priced in in stock prices, and therefore a good economy not necessarily extend what has already been a good stock market. That's happened many times. The thesis, though, in this particularly good economy that we are in right now um, for uh, uh, stock prices po having the potential to move higher and, and take a longer period of time in how long this bull market that we've been in for nine years will last. That thesis, forgive me for the long setup, is that a new run or a new era of capital expenditures and business investment enhancing productivity is, is potentially coming. And to the degree that tax reform, expensing of capital investment, of business investment through capital expenditures, uh, adds in a um, after-tax cash flow way to businesses' appetite to do such things and ability to do them, that on the supply side, we generate um, the fruits that will that will themselves bear more fruit into the future. It is not an outlandish theory. It's frankly a very likely one. It's one we believe in, but we don't believe in uh, as a risk-free proposition. We see plenty of things that could get in the way if you follow me, okay? The trade and tariff issue is a big one. In theory, I don't happen to believe it will happen, but in theory, um, an overzealous Federal Reserve uh, from a monetary policy standpoint could disrupt that momentum. So there's things like that. Uh, obviously, geopolitical interference, unexpected issues from China, you know, uh, not to mention events that we're just not thinking of, like I said, geopolitically or otherwise. So... Right now, the theory itself is that capital goods orders are increasing, industrial production. The global economy is cooperating. There's a good customer base out there from Europe to China to Japan, emerging markets. Um, there's a lot of reasons to believe that, that the, the, whole, the table's been set in such a way to facilitate this. And then, you know, if you're a bear, uh, meaning negative on stock markets right now, you might say, no, the market's just too overpricey. And, and we don't buy that theory. The, the valuations on the market um, have had to be recalibrated because the after-tax earnings of the market have, uh, those projections have been moved up dramatically. We'll see how much forward guidance changes throughout this earnings season after the first quarter as companies 
project through the remainder of the year, but we believe um, that co- that our company profits are growing, growing handsomely, uh, and that the valuation that is placed on those, if you look across the entire stock market, is a little expensive, not ridiculous, but when you take out from your investable pool of stocks those names, and it might be less than 10 names. I frankly think it is, okay? You could take out the whole tech sector if you wanted, but you don't have to do that. If you just took out about 10 names, that market multiple becomes very, very uh, reasonable. Um, Very fair value, not excess value. So in other words, evaluation is the concern the overall valuation of the market is being brought up by just a very small amount of companies. And therefore, one could cure for that alleged valuation concern by just simply not owning those companies. Now, we don't happen to own them anyways. A lot of investors that are most concerned about valuation do own them. But I would argue that they should be concerned about those companies' valuation if they want to be concerned about such a thing, not concerned about the overall market. We look and do a lot of segments of the market that we believe are undervalued, and we're trying to create attractive long-term return, long-term return propositions for our clients. So I do believe that there are pockets that are extremely investable and attractive um, and, and would not necessarily buy the entire market at this price, um, even though I don't necessarily think the entire market has a valuation reason to be avoided. Um, it's not going to generate the future returns that the last seven years have generated um, because of the valuation level now versus seven, eight, nine years ago. But that is very different than saying that the market is due for a a violent reversal. Um, Hopefully you understand what I'm saying here. I look across the macro risk of economic slowdown. Everyone talked about the VIX going so much higher, and frankly... Um, the fear indicator that they call the VIX is a very bad indicator for a lot of reasons to begin with, um, not to least of which are the technical issues that surround how heavily exchange-traded products now use the VIX. But um, high-yield bond spreads, consider this as an indicator of macroeconomic risk or fear in the, in the economy overall. When those spreads are tightening, that's people being willing to take less yield for investments uh, that hold a a fair amount of risk. And when spreads are are expanding, that means investors are demanding more compensation for the risk they're taking. We've seen spreads utterly collapse over this last month or so. Um, There is a part of that that's related to oil prices because a lot of the high yield bond markets correlated to the energy sector. And oil prices have moved up handsomely. But even oil prices themselves moving up contradict the risk-off thesis. Um, I, would, I would point out that interest rates and their impact on the stock market's real. If indeed interest rates were to move enough to impact the stock market. And I would point out, as I'm not going to stop pointing out, that the trade and tariff issue is real. But as far as the idea of a macroeconomic uh, story being unattractive to markets, the high yield bond spreads are telling you, which is hundreds of billions of dollars of very sophisticated economic actors with actual skin in the game telling you that the way in which prices, risk is being priced um, is indicating low fee, low, very low fear about, about some of those um, broad economic concerns or headwinds. So I right now as an equity investor on behalf of my client's capital am uh, very focused on individual companies' performance, their execution, their growth of free cash flow, and their capital allocation decisions where these companies are being willing to reward shareholders with increased dividends and where their own strategy and execution are leading to growing the free cash flow. Um, that we believe is the mother's milk of investing in equities. That's what we're focused on. We got to pay attention a little bit to North Korea. We got to pay a little bit of attention to Robert Mueller. I don't pay any attention to Stormy Daniels, and that's that's true in a lot of different ways. Um, I, what else? Uh, Trump's Twitter account doesn't mean anything to us. 
day-to-day volatility doesn't mean anything to us. Uh, we're just trying to find good companies to deliver these great long-term returns uh, that are in an appropriate risk adjustment. And I believe that can be done. And I believe uh, right now the longer-term bullish story relies upon growing capital expenditures and productivity coming into the business investment side of the market and the economy. So that's the story we're going to keep watching and I'm going to keep talking about. And probably I bored you enough by now. But if you have any questions, reach out anytime. You have to, have to go to DividendCafe.com this week. We have a lot of different charts and illustrations, a lot of fun things I didn't get into in the video. Go check it out. Uh, and thank you for listening, watching, reading, viewing the Dividend Cafe. Thanks so much.